Yeah, so th thank you everyone for uh, for attending our our first um, I think uh, big event for this year, um, which is uh, introduce introduction to quantum computing. And uh, yes, yeah, so let's start. My name is uh, Bobby Corpus. I'm not sure if you can see me. Let me see. If, uh, I don't know. Let's start with you. Yeah, so yeah, uh, my name is Bobby Corpus. And let's start. So uh, I think before anything else, let me introduce my my group. We are the One Quantum <coughs> Philippines. So uh, we started in uh, uh, 2017, um, it's about five years ago, uh, as a Facebook group and also as a meetup group in the Philippines. And we, um, so our activities are mainly on meetups and also uh, delivering uh, lectures online, um, lecture series, like for example, uh, uh, seven part series on Shor's algorithm and you know, a lot of introductory uh, presentations like this. And uh, yeah, so, um, it was very difficult for us to, to actually scale um, the group. And then fortunately with the help of, of uh, an American named Brian Cyberworks, who is also here in this, uh, this speed up, um, he introduced us to One Quantum Global. And that's the reason why uh, One Quantum Global community uh, recognized us as a as a chapter of One Quantum um, in the Philippines. And uh, I'm the first president. So because of that, we now have access to global resources, uh, global um, ex uh, experts in quantum computing, and also resources um, in learning quantum computing. So that's the uh, bar. And uh, things that we believe in, uh we are inclusive so according to our ceo uh Rupesh, we we don't select we accept and um so the purpose also of our group is to uh, democratize quantum computing so quantum computing is is uh, quite uh, difficult to approach it's a subject that's uh it's not easy uh but we want to be able to, you know, uh, have this goal to remove it from its status as a ivory tower and make it accessible uh, to people. And quantum computing is uh, ultimately for our kids. Uh, they, can, they can be my kids or your kids because the, the future generation, they are the ones who are going to probably build uh, a quantum computer with, you know, a billion qubits. And they are still the the elementary schools probably. And we want to make sure that we are able to influence, um, you know, the, the education so that, you know, quantum for them is, will ultimately become an everyday uh, subject. Like it's, it's normal, okay? So right now it's not normal for us, but, you know, we want it to be normal for our kids also, okay? Uh, yeah, and um, so uh, our meetup today is sponsored by uh, Eight Layer, and, uh, and uh, I'd like to call on Merrick Merrick Mara, who is the CEO of Eight Layer, to give a few words. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Bob. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. So I think uh, uh, we're just about to start the uh, quantum computing uh, 101. Again, I'm Merrick. I'm the CEO and chairman of Eight Layer, and we've been in the industry for more than 17 years now. 
and we focus actually on uh, cybersecurity and software development. So we're so happy that Bobby and his group is now here in our office uh, doing this kind of uh, activity. And we hope that you will learn a lot uh, in, in this evening session. So I guess that's it. Uh, aside from that, I'm also the president of the Rotary Club of the Quezon City Media Tech. So it's actually an international service organization. So uh, please visit our uh, Facebook page, uh, RCQC Media Tech. So good evening and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for that uh, wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, so, Okay, so my assumptions here uh, for those who are attending is that um, we don't have a background of quantum computing. Okay. Um, yeah, so I have to make that assumption because uh, there's a, a lot of levels. Uh, people, you know, when they attend, they, uh, they have different levels of uh, uh, learning about quantum computing. And I want to, I want to focus on, on those that, you know, uh, first time that they've heard and they're curious. So that's my focus. So which means that I will not be able to cover anything uh, sufficiently advanced for anyone who's already, already advancing in, in, this, uh, in this group. And uh, next is, uh, you know, probably a basic uh, knowledge of algebraic manipulation because, um, you know, it's, it's just quite hard to explain the basis of quantum computing without actually learning the theory behind it. Okay, so, so because of the mathematics, we, we will learn how it works. Okay, so that's, that's my um, assumption. So, and also, um, we won't go into the physics of quantum computing. So our approach here is, it is, is more of the, uh, the quantum computing, which is the, the computing side of, of, yeah, uh, of uh, quantum information. Okay, so quantum computing is just a branch of quantum information science. Uh, so, yeah, so we will not touch into the, uh, how it's implemented or the physics. Probably we'll, we'll, we'll talk something uh, later, but we will not focus on that. Okay. So just enough theory to get you started. Yeah. So this is what we'll cover. And then, uh, so we'll define the uh, qubit and then quantum gates. And then from quantum gates, we create quantum circuits. And then I'll show you how it is programmed in, uh, in IBM uh, Kiskin. So what's uh, probably, we'll, we'll, why quantum computing? Why am I here? Why, what? why do we care about quantum computing okay so the reason why quantum computing is uh you know it's exciting is because of this um it's it's able to it's been demonstrated theoretically that it can it can crack the uh, rsa and elliptic curve cryptography okay so so why is this very important? Because RSA and elliptic curves, these are the encryption that we use on a daily basis. Like for example, when we uh, transact online, okay, we buy something from PayPal, or we go, we, uh, <clears throat> we log into our bank using the, um, the uh, HTTPS protocol. So the, the, uh, the encryption that's, that is being used there are based on this, um, uh, crypto systems. And um, so right now, there are only a few qubits, okay? It's probably less than 100 or probably 100, less than 150 qubits available, which is not sufficient, okay? So to crack the uh, 20, 48 bit encryption, okay? So right now we're safe, okay? Why are we safe right now? Because without the quantum computer, assuming there's no quantum computer, um, and you only have your your classical computer, like, like what I'm holding right now, which is the uh, laptop, to to decrypt RSA-based uh, encryption. You you need about 
300 trillion years. Okay, so I mean that's okay, right? <laughs> it should be uh, all, all dead and gone by that time. So doesn't matter. But uh, <clears throat> but assuming we have uh, sufficiently enough uh, qubits, then it's um, uh, quantum a quantum computer using the Shor's algorithm will be able to do that. And the, and the thing about um, the Shor's algorithm, which is um, yeah, which is uh, mentioned here, is that the reason why it can decrypt both RSA and elliptic curve is because if you look at the RSA, which is based on the on the uh, the hardness. The difficulty to factor out a very big number, imagine 2 to the 24th day. Okay, it's very hard to factor. And also the elliptic curve, which is based on the, uh, the algebra of the, of the geometry of elliptic curves. These two different crypto systems, which are based on two different things. One is uh, number theoretic and the other one is geometric. The thing is, both of them are actually, if you take a look at them from a, from a more abstract level, they are the same mathematically, okay? And it's called the discrete logarithm problem. And that's the reason why Shor's uh, algorithm is able to uh, graph it. Okay, so, so, so in encryption, uh, there are two kinds of encryption. Uh, so one of them is the uh, the symmetric uh, what, uh, symmetric uh, encryption, and the other one is the is the asymmetric encryption. Okay, so now um, when, when we want to encrypt, like for example, if I want to to send a, a message to someone, and I want to be um, I want to encrypt it. Um, I'm going to be using a, a symmetric uh, encryption because this one is faster than the asymmetric encryption. So, but, but the use of the asymmetric encryption is for me to be able to set my my uh, uh, symmetric key, you know, so that, for example, myself and uh, Alice will be able to agree on that key. But in order for me to send that key to Alice, there is a uh, I have to, to send it over the public, okay? So public, uh, uh, which means anyone could could intercept it. So I need to to use the asymmetric uh, or public key infrastructure in order to um, uh, to to send my my uh, public uh, uh, symmetric key to Alice in a, in a secure manner. Um, However, um, because uh, a lot of, uh, there's just a lot of uh, intelligent people in the world and, you know, it's possible for them to be able to, to be the man in the middle, like between me and Alice, someone else will, will, uh, will uh, impersonate me, become, uh, Personally, me to Alice. So, if I send uh, a message to Alice, it's, I'm actually sending a message to that guy. That guy will encrypt it, encrypt it with Alice's um, public key, and then send it to Alice. So, that's possible. But with quantum computing, the the But, the, but with the uh, quantum computer, the, the behavior is different. So uh, with, uh, with the quantum systems, whenever a, whenever a message you know, it, uh, it is sent and uh, someone else will read that message, that, that message which is encoded in, in, in a quantum uh, uh, qubit will be uh, will be tampered with. So, in terms of uh, uh, they, they call it, uh, it will it will collapse 
the state of collapse right, into into a basis from which the uh, the the attacker or the obstructor is uh, is, uh, is measured. So uh, so when this guy like E, you try to uh, send it to the uh, uh, to Alice. What will happen is that also yeah, I'm sending to Alice. What will happen is that uh, there's a probability that Alice is going to be able to detect the presence of a of an eavesdropper. And uh, so, so I say there's a probability. So, but Alice and, for example, me, Bob, we can increase that probability to us to us uh, to, to a uh, to a degree uh, closer, as close as possible to certain things, as close as possible to one, so that we can uh, determine that there's really an eavesdropper. And when we determine that there's an eavesdropper, we can just uh, start all of our, all of the qubits and probably begin again. Okay, so that's a quantum key distribution. Okay, so the next is uh, has something to do with searching. Okay, so um, well, well, I have a very, I have a favorite question to usually to uh, to prospective programmers. So suppose you know in the in the in the, in the context of the Philippines, you know, suppose you in, in the in the bar exam, okay. Um, the the the, uh, the result of the bar exam was was already out there, and it's given a piece of paper, okay. And those pieces of paper contain your name, okay, your name. Very small piece of paper. And let's say, just for theoretical sake, there are probably a million of them, okay. And then they just dump it on your lap, and then someone will say. Okay, so whenever someone will ask whether the name is in that file, then you have to answer them. So as a programmer, so what you'll do is uh, you will uh, sort this uh, piece of paper into alphabetical order. And then once it's sorted, it's, it's now very easy to determine if someone's name is there or not. Okay, so for example, there are a million uh, of these, that's, there's about uh, uh, 20. Uh, you need to you need to uh, take a look, uh, like uh, compare, do comparisons 20 times before you can you can find that uh, name or the name is not there. Okay, so the worst case. Now, um, if you take a look at that. The, uh, so this one is more of a, uh, in computer science, there is there is what is known as a, um, a complexity, okay? that the time complexity, it is the amount of time or the number of uh, executions of a certain algorithm uh, or number of steps that you need to do in order to, uh, for example, in this case, find something. So for finding something, you have to sort it, and it takes about n log n of uh, steps. And then for finding something using, for example, binary search, uh, you will need to, uh, you will need to uh, do it a log n time, uh, not base to n time. So, uh, so the entire thing is about n log n. But with a uh, Grover's algorithm, Grover's algorithm. With Grover's algorithm, um, we only need about a quadrat, uh, the square root of n. Okay, so for example, if uh, we have uh, here's a here's a graph of that. How fast is this? 
So, for example, if you have uh, 700 items, then the red the, the red line is the graph of of the searching, the sorting, and the searching, and then the uh, the blue line is the graph of square root of that event. So, which means it's it's very fast. Okay, and and this one is unstructured search. Okay, so so which means you don't even need to sort it; you just have to search. So that's a that's the beauty of uh, of, uh, of quantum search, which is also known as Grover's algorithm. So Grover's algorithm is used primarily in uh, uh, quantum machine learning. So uh, of uh, about probably half of the uh, uh, proposed uh, algorithms in quantum machine learning use Grover's algorithm. And the reason for that, and it's also used in, uh, so it's used in machine learning. And the reason for that is because you can use Grover's algorithm, not only to search for that item that you want to search, but also you can search for the maximum, for example, if you have a, a set of numbers, the, the maximum of that set, and also also the minimum. And art, artificial learning in uh, in uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence. There's a lot of uh, it's all about optimization. So optimization, optimization is finding the minimum and the maximum. So that's why it's. Uh, but we're not going to touch that. So this is the uh, this is probably the only um, uh, physics that we need right now in order for you to uh, to know the basis of uh, quantum computing. So you can see that there are three uh, drawings there. The first drawing is. Uh, there's a uh, machine gun uh, firing bullets at, uh, at the wall with, uh, with two slits. And, and the slit number two is uh, closed currently. Okay. So if, if slit number one is, is open, then the, uh, the graph that you see here, okay, the graph that you see here, it will tell you the number or the distribution or the uh, distribution of where the bullets, the concentration of the bullets uh, are hitting the, uh, the wall that is uh, in here. Okay. So, and then if you, if you close this and then you open this, you will get uh, almost the same thing. Okay. It's a mirror image. And then if you open both, then you will get this uh, distribution of the concentration of uh, bullets okay. now but this one is uh, is uh, is non quantum because the, the bullets are big but in here there's a uh, this one here is a uh, water so water is a wave now if you in, this, in the same way you, you open one and then you close the other so you will get this distribution and this distribution. But when you open both, you will get this uh, interference pattern, okay? Interference pattern of the of the waves. Now, take a look at this. So this is where the quantum uh, effects uh, come in. So you have a, uh, a, just one electron, okay? So just one electron, if you open both, Okay, but let us say you open one, then you will, there's a distribution of where the electrons end up in the filament in here. And if you open the other, this one here. But if you open both, okay, and only one electron, there's an interference pattern that will be formed, okay? And what does that mean? This means that the electron behave like a wave, okay? And also, that the electron passed through both slits. Okay, so if the electron passed through both slits, you know, that's the that's the basis of our quantum computing. Okay, 
So we have, we can now have a system where we can have the electron having to, having to, uh, to be in two different states okay, at the same time. So that's the, uh, that's the basis of, of uh, quantum computing. Okay. So let's uh, take a look. What's a bit? So classically, uh, this is apparently what we're using here in, in our computers. We have, uh, we're using bits. Okay? A bit has a definite value. Okay? It's either a zero or a one. Okay? So if you have a bit, it allows us to to represent any number in binary, okay? Now, where do you use bits, okay? So, uh, we use bits, we use bits to represent numbers in binary, and, and uh, in fact, any, all information in this world, you know, can be, can be uh, represented as, uh, as a bit. Okay. Like for example, uh, take take any uh, take any prose that this uh, take any uh, book, okay, which is composed of numbers, letters, special characters, okay, and, and even images. Now, take for example the letter A, capital A. The capital A can be uh, is represented by the by the number. Uh, 65 ASCII uh, number 65. 65 can be represented as a as a binary. So which means every uh, information can be represented as uh, binary. Okay. So why is that important to us? Okay. okay. So now, so that's the classical uh, classical representation of uh, information. Now let's go to the quantum mechanical. Uh, presentation, which is uh, the qubit. Okay, so the qubit can have a value of zero, can have a value of one, it can have a value of both at the same time. Okay. So that's the. So if you take a look at this what this statement here and uh, connect it to the uh, to the drawing which I showed you earlier, where an electron can have can be in two different states at the same time. That's that's. Uh, that's how it's possible for a qubit to be in superposition. Okay, so we call that thing superposition. Okay, and uh, and the thing is, if you have uh, if you have lots of qubits, these qubits can represent a number. Okay, and so for example, if if all of the qubits have a definite value, whatever the value that of each qubit, you can you can convert that into a, a number. But since it is a qubit and it can be it can be made into superposition, then it means that it can re represent all numbers that the, that the set of qubits can represent at the same time. So, so which means if a qubit can be, you know, uh, can be at, uh, and represent any number at, at the same time. So what's the value of a qubit? So you can only get the value, you can only get a definite value if, uh, if, if you measure, if you measure. And the number that you get depends on the probability of that number occurring. Okay, uh, so how do we say that a qubit is both zero and one at the same time? Okay, so this is where, this is where we, uh, this is where we need to uh, represent something already in, in, you know, in, let's just say, uh, elementary math, like high school math in order to, to say something about the qubit. Okay. So if I say we, um, we uh, a, 
qubit is both zero and one at the same time. I want to be able to express that as a piece of mathematics. Okay, so so that it's uh, concise. So um, if we have a definite value of a qubit, let us say the qubit is uh, the value is zero, then we can we can symbolize uh, we can symbolize the qubit as uh, the symbol here. Okay. So the symbol here, um, so for those who are not familiar with this, uh, this is, this symbolizes a, um, a vector. Um, and the notation came from uh, Paul Dirac. So he's one of the inventors of quantum mechanics. And this is called the cat vector. Okay, so there's, uh, there's, there's a bra uh, vector and a cat vector, but um, this one is the, a cat vector. Okay, so you see something like that. Okay. Now, if uh, if the qubit is in state one, then we symbolize it. We symbolize it as this one here. Okay. So if it's uh, if the qubit is in both zero and one, this is how we symbolize it. Okay. So we let's. Uh, so the side here is the state vector. Okay? So it represents the uh, uh, the state of the qubit, which is represented by a combination of zero and one. Okay, so there's a plus sign there, and uh, the, the numbers a and b here are uh, numbers a and b here are uh, complex numbers. Okay, now, um, so when we measure this qubit, okay, uh, the value is either zero and one, but the outcome, so, so we know it's zero and one, but, but um, it's either zero and one, but it really depends on the, on the uh, numbers A and B, which, which are complex numbers. Because those complex numbers, um, when you get the modulus, the square of the modulus, okay, this one here, the square of the modulus, that represents the probability of that of that state to occur. Okay. So this is just an example. Okay. So if you are a high school student and you might be familiar with this, okay. So since these are general probabilities, then uh, we require that the square of a, of a and b, if you add them, that should be equal to one. Okay. Now, um, so how do we interpret a and b? Okay. So I'm not going into the the, the more the, the, the much what you call this the uh, the proper representation of uh, of a qubit which is which is uh, the block sphere okay? the block sphere is actually uh, the complex plane which you wrap into wrap which you bend into a sphere and you put the uh, infinity you tie it to infinity to get the Raymond sphere okay? uh, I don't want to discuss that here because this one is uh, uh, introductory. Okay. So, but to give you an illustration, since you are um, uh, probably uh, familiar with with vectors in high school, the the A and B they are just components of your of your state vector. Okay. So, so this is A here, the component along the A, uh, the zero uh, direction. Okay. And then one here, the component along the, uh, the and P here is the component along the one direction. Cool. One direction is like a, it's like a boy band. But anyway, uh, so, so, <laughs> so that's how, uh, that's how you imagine it. Uh, that's how you can visualize it. Okay, okay so, 
So if we have two qubits, what are the possibilities? Okay. So now, so previously we have one qubit and now we have two qubits. What are the possible possible numbers we can get out of it of two qubits? So we can generate if you if you you, you can generate all the possibilities here because there's just only two pivots, okay? So those are the possibilities. Uh, and we, we have to uh, remember that the order is significant, okay? So for example, this is our first qubit and this is our second qubit. Now, if, if, you, if you change the order, that's a right different, okay? So we, we, don't, we don't want that. That confuses us. Okay. So for a two qubit system, we can we can we can write the possible all the possible combinations of a two qubit system as a as, as a sum. Okay, as a sum. And this one is called superposition. Okay. So the uh, what you call this the uh, the numbers a sub zero, a sub one, okay, a sub n. These are the uh, these are the uh, this, this refer to the uh, probability amplitude. Okay, so so this they, they will give you the probability of a certain state to to uh, uh, to come up. Okay, so this one is. Uh, so if you have a two qubit system, any number can be can be represented at once, okay? But if you remember our binary system, okay? So we have 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. These are just 0, 1, 2, 3, okay? So if you translate that, Okay, to translate that, this is just the summation of, of all states 0, 1, 2, and 3. So what does that mean? That if you have a qubit in superposition, all of the numbers can be represented at once. Okay. So what does that mean? It means that so so which we can compactly write as this. Okay. So this is also part of the, the mathematics that we need. Um, you know, we just want to write things compactly. Okay, so like that. Uh, summation. But what does that mean? So it means that uh, whatever mathematical operation that, that you want to do on a qubit, you actually do it for all. Okay, so, so what do I mean by that? Okay. What I mean by that is that if you take the square root of the qubit, you actually take the square root of everything, okay? So like this, you get the square root as superposition, okay? It's a superposition square root. And where, and, and this one, this, this one is, uh, so, so, so that's the power of quantum computing, to be able to, uh, to do things in parallel, okay? And this one is, in fact, used in the Schwarz algorithm. Okay, so in the Schwarz algorithm, we are trying to find the period of. Uh, we are trying to find the period of uh, of this function here. Okay, so when, whenever you encrypt in RSA, whenever you encrypt, you you, you have to use this. Uh, uh, you have to use this. Uh, uh, modular exponentiation, and and uh, this modular exponentiation. If you, uh, for example, if, if I was a if I was a cracker, okay, and I have all the time in the universe, and I and I want to crack the RSA, okay, even if it will take me three hundred trillion years, <clears throat> what I'll do is just to get the get get the, uh, the value of, of this for all numbers generated, okay? So there are, if the number is, uh, so all numbers between zero and two to the, uh, 
dioxide. The, the number zero uh, up to two to the twenty-four to eight. What I'll do is get the values of this, and whenever the value is equal to one, I can then compute the period. Once I get the period, I can then compute. <clears throat> I can then have another step before I can decrypt the uh, the RSA. But the period is the, the most important thing. So once I get the period, I'm able to decrypt the RSA. So so and the reason why Shor's algorithm is is able to do that is because of the uh, uh, you can do it because you can do it for all values. Okay, so for example here. 13 to 0, and then 13 to 1, 13 to the 2, you get the, 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 the value of f of x, okay? Now, here's an illustration. If the, so this, this one here is, is your qubit. x is your qubit, okay? And this is the, uh, the decimal representation of your qubit. So your qubit, the value goes from 0 up to, up to uh, for, for here, 14, okay? And uh, and and here, when you apply f of x, you apply it to all of it, okay, to, to all of them. And then here you can see you can already see that that from here the value is one, and then the, the next the next time one occurs is in here, okay. So which, which means that the period is four, okay, one two three four, okay, one two three four. That's the uh, that's the benefit of uh, superposition. Okay. So, how do we get the answer to the problem that we are solving? Uh, it's by measuring the system. Okay. So, um, so what we are so there's a lot of interpretation of quantum mechanics, but we are just going to, to use the standard. Or the the default interpretation, which is the Copenhagen interpretation. So, which means that if you measure the system, it will it will uh, collapse into a state, and the probability of that state to occur is uh, given by the by the square of the modules. Okay, so that's the interpretation. Okay? So, when you measure your your superposition, like for example, this one. It will give you a number, okay? But that number, the, 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 the result of your measurement depends on the, on the probability of occurring, which is um, given by the, uh, the square of the model. So for example, if you measure it and you get a two, so, so I mean, when you measure it, you will get a two with probability of, uh, a to squared, okay? So that's the probability. Okay, after the measurement, the state will then become, will then collapse to the value of the, of, of what was measured. So for example, uh, before it was in superposition, now that you measured it and you get a two, the, the state is now in, in this state. Okay? So the, the qubit is now, the qubit system is now in this state. Okay, so um, so there's a difference between probability, ordinary probabilities, and the, the probability that you get in quantum computing. So, for example, if you have a coin and you toss it, um, the probability of getting a head or a tail is 0.5. Okay. Now, if you toss, now if you have a quantum coin with a probability of 0.5 for heads or tails, and then when you toss it, you get a head. The question is, uh, what is the probability of getting a head? Toss it again. And the probability is 
one. And the reason for that is because your quantum point has now become ahead, okay? And if you measure it again in quick su succession, you will still get ahead, okay? And the reason why you have to measure it in quick succession, succession is because uh, if uh, there's a ample time between the measurements, then the, uh, the state of your quantum point will evolve, okay? Using the, uh, uh, in accordance with the square equation, okay? So that's why it is to be the quick succession. Okay. <clears throat> now entanglement is another, is another uh, important area important concept in quantum computing. Um, so entanglement, um, you have a, a system of, for example here, two qubits that are entangled. Okay, so, so which means that if you measure the system, and for example, if you measure the first qubit at the system and you get uh, the, and the value of the first qubit is zero, then you are sure that the value of the next cube of the second qubit is one. The same way, the value of the, the qubit that you measured is one, then you are sure that the, uh, the value of the other qubit is zero. That's called entanglement. Now, entanglement is, um, you can see application of entanglement in quantum teleportation. Um, so you can, you can send, uh, you can teleport a, a qubit to a different uh, to, to a different uh, uh, location by by doing entanglement but that, that but, but teleportation doesn't really uh, carry the qubit to the other location what what it does is uh, it will replicate the state in the other location and this the qubit that you have here will be destroyed Okay, so that's that's teleportation. But the other the other um, uh, you can also see entanglement in the Schwarz algorithm. Okay, so in the Schwarz algorithm, uh, for example, you have this, and suppose when you measure this this uh, qubit here, which is the which is the output uh, qubits. If you measure it and you get a, for example, a seven, then automatically you will your the state of the of the, the qubits represented represented by x will collapse into those that only have that are only uh, that corresponds to the number seven. Okay, so that's uh, that's also used in the Charles algorithm. So, so, so far, um, so far, what do we have? Okay, so what we have is that, what we know so far is, uh, if you have a qubit, then it can represent all numbers that those uh, qubits, you know, uh, are allowed. And then, so far, um, if we measure, if you do some mathematical uh, operation, then, then this, uh, this operation will be applied to all values that the qubit will, uh, will assume. And then when you measure it, you'll get a definite answer, okay? And the answer depends on the probability. But so far, what, what I have been showing you is that all numbers is possible, okay? So which means that if, I, if you measure it, then any number can actually be, uh, can actually be the result, okay? So, if all numbers have the same probability of occurring, then quantum computing will have to be that useful, okay? So, but what's an example of, of, a, uh, of those uh, times where the probabilities are not the same, okay? So, I'll give an example. Okay, suppose we have a, uh, a system of two dice, okay? <clears throat> uh, so a die has uh, uh, has uh, six faces, okay? That's, 
it is uh, labeled with numbers, okay, or, or dots. And uh, the minimum is one for, 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 for each guy, there's a minimum of uh, one dot, and then, and then the maximum uh, number of dots is six, okay? <coughs> and suppose with these two dice, we want to throw them, and whatever is the, whatever face we get, we get the sum, okay? So we get the sum, okay? And if we, if we are going to make a bet, okay? What number would you would you bet okay, in order to to win okay, to, to maximize your uh, chances of winning? Okay, so so we can take a look at the the, the possible uh, ways in which uh, 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 a system of two dice can have a sum. Okay, so for example, this one is your first die. Okay, and then your second die is here. So the matrix that you see here, the, the entries that you see here are the sum. So for example, uh, if one die get, gives a one and the other die gives a four, then it gives you a five, it's the sum, okay? So if you take a look at this, then the number seven is the, is the sum that occurs the most, okay? Number seven, okay. So you can visualize it uh, like that. Okay? So, for example, if you bet with number seven, then it has a probability of occurring, which is six over thirty-six, or one over six. Okay. Now we can represent this system of two dice as a state vector. Okay. Like this. Okay. Like that one. Okay. And each of the each of the uh, uh, or this each of the uh, each of the numbers there will give you the probability. Okay, so which means uh, this one will give you uh, uh, so the num the, the state seven will give you the uh, probability uh, high, the highest probability. So that's the that's the uh... now. So, so, so now the next question is: So, how do I make certain certain states to be to be more probable than others? Okay, and the answer is uh, quantum gates. So, quantum gates are those uh, are operations you uh, you perform the qubits in order to. Uh, transform them uh, to modify the uh, probability of uh, certain states to occur. Okay. They're also called operators. So in classical computing, we are familiar with the uh, uh, with a case like or and, okay? all this uh, listed here. So there's also a counterpart in one of so there's a, this is an example of a gate that that uh, is used to add two numbers. Okay, so to add two uh, two bits. Okay? So this is the full adder. So which means if you want to if you want to implement a, a uh, addition, you can use gates. Okay, so that's uh, that that. that uh, this is uh, how it's implemented in our in our computers. So, in, in quantum computing, there's also a uh, corresponding. Uh, also have uh, corresponding gates. And in fact, there is a gate that will give you the superposition of all of the uh, of, of, of states. Okay, so there's a gate to do that. Uh, another example of gate is the dot gate, which will uh, which when when you operate it with the with a state, it will give you, uh, for example, the uh, zero state to give you the, the one state and vice versa. Okay, so mathematically it's like this: um, you represent it as a uh, as a as symbol x operating on the uh, on the cat, 
uh, zero and it will give you a one. And the same thing, the same way, if you let it operate in a one, it will give you a zero. Okay. Now, this is the unsung hero of uh, of uh, quantum gates, and this is probably the the. I mean, without this, I don't think there's a quantum computer. Okay, so the Hadamard gate. So the Hadamard gate is uh, transforms transforms your uh, uh, qubit zero into a superposition of zero and one, and, and the other one also is the same, except we have here a minus sign. Okay? So I will not go into the details of why it's a minus there, okay? Because it's a uh, doctorate. But uh, you can just uh, treat this as uh, a rule that if you have a Hadamard gate acting on a zero, it will be in this uh, this superposition, and if you have Hadamard acting on a one, it will you it will give you that um, that formula. Okay. So, so this is more really of a notation because uh, <clears throat> uh, sometimes notations can be scary, especially if it's the first thing that it's the first time that you have seen uh, notations. But we have already seen this er earlier. So this this is a this is how we represent uh, two qubits. Where the order is uh, important. This is also the same as uh, if you if you see a uh, a circle with an X, uh, which is called the uh, notation for a tensor. Um, it, so it's the same as this one, and and if you are lazy, um, I mean, not really lazy, but it's just so hard. It's it's it's, it's easier. To write it like this, okay. Just rem just remember that they are the same, okay. Of course, the order is important. So from now on, if we if we write uh, zero zero, the text zero zero, it means these two things. Okay? So. So if we have two gates, so this is uh, where I need your uh, uh, attention now, because here I have two gates, okay? So I have two gates that are um, this uh, two here, and I have a Hadamard uh, gate acting on each qubit, okay? So this one here, okay, is also the same as H uh, O star two. Okay, so this notation that you see here is the same as this one. Okay, and it only means that it applies to each qubit uh, individually. So the the first Hadamard applies to the, the rightmost qubit, and the second Hadamard applies to the uh, the leftmost qubit. Okay. So it's like that, okay? So what am I what, what am I showing you now? So what I'm showing you right now is that if I have qubits initialized to zero and I apply a Hadamard transform to each one of them, what will be the result? Okay, we want to know the result, okay? So, uh, so the mathematical case part of the usual. So so they follow the usual rules of algebra, except that the order is important. Okay, so you can treat the uh, you, you, you can treat the uh, you, can, you can treat the qubits as uh, like your variables. Okay, and then if there's a number there, uh, you you follow the usual rules of algebra. Okay? For example, if uh, Okay, I'll show you later. So what will happen if you do this one? Okay. So we know since we know that this 
So we already know this. And you already saw this earlier, okay? So given this, how would you derive this? Okay? So to derive this, you just need to use your high school algebra, okay? You just have to multiply them, which is this uh, the tensor product, okay? And then, for example, this one here, uh, this zero here, you multiply it with uh, zero here, okay? So you get a double zero. And the zero here, you multiply it with a one here, okay? And then you get a zero one, okay? So the important, uh, the order is important, okay? And in the same way, you do for the rest, okay? And this is what you get. And then if you remember that these binary numbers can be converted into decimal numbers, then zero, zero is nothing but zero. Zero, one is one. One, zero is two. And one, one is three, okay? And then furthermore, if you want to make it compact, this is the, the result. So what does this mean? It means, what does this mean? It means it's superposition of all possible values of the qubit. It's a superposition of state. So which means if you start with two qubits, initialize a zero and apply Hadamard, you will get superposition of states. Okay? So that's the, that's the reason why we need the mathematics, okay? We need, we need the mathematics in order to understand, and later, or in the future, in the future presentation, we will need it in order to compute, okay? So that's a, so it is the other part here that transforms our qubit into the familiar superposition. Okay, so here's a simulation of the other part here and the corresponding problem. So it's a simulation. So theoretically, the probabilities are the same, okay? But since this is a simulation, you can see that there are some differences, okay? But the probabilities of each one of them, okay, if you take a look at this one, the probabilities of this one is at zero, this one is one, this one is two, this one is three, okay, four, five, six, seven, okay? And the probability of them occurring is the same. Okay, that's the uh, the mark. Superposition. Okay, there's also a gate that will allow us to do a if 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 condition. Okay, which is called a control that gate. So, so this gate is special because it needs two qubits. It needs two qubits. The first qubit is called the control qubit, and the second qubit is called the target qubit. Okay. So the control qubit will, will, de will determine whether we need to, to, to change the target qubit, okay? So if the, according to the control map gate, okay, if the, uh, so this is the, like a truth table, okay? So this is the, uh, there is the uh, what you call this, the, uh, the rules. If you have a zero and a zero, if you have a zero here, uh, and the zero, you get zero. So if you take a look at this, you can summarize the rule as if, if the control qubit x is zero, then the, the target qubit will stay the same, okay? But if the control qubit is one, then the target qubit will flip using the x key or the not key. Okay, so there are actually a lot more gates, but uh, we will uh, learn about them okay, some other time. Okay. So now that we have qubits and then we have gates, if we combine them, we have uh, quantum circuits. Okay. So quantum circuits, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to, to use uh, uh, Qiskit which is a um, 
a framework uh, by IBM. Okay, there's a lot of uh, frameworks out there. So there's a framework also by, uh, like for example, by by Microsoft. Uh, there's a framework by Google. But if you if you think about it, if you don't know anything about the gates, then you then you would not also know how to use this because or you would not even know how to use any of them because uh, all of them are just based on the same concept. Okay, the gate is just an Adamard gate, okay, it's an up gate, it's a control not gate. Just all of those gates are um, you need to use them whatever framework that you use. So in here uh, I'm just using Cascade because uh, it's based on Python and it's also the first um, framework that I have, I have used and um, I have not other uh, uh, use other frameworks. Okay, so in a uh, so in a quantum circuit, you have a uh, input qubit, uh, input register. And then you have an output register, and then you have a Pascal register. Okay. So the so the reason why we have a classical register is we we want to be able to measure okay, the answer. So that's why we have a classical register. So this is this is this one is the, uh, the basic uh, uh, quantum circuit. Okay. It only has qubits and only has measurements and nothing else. So at least you know that there's an input, there's an output, and there's a uh, class of fit to get the answer. So to code this very simple uh, circuit, the, the coding is also simple. Okay, so it's it's uh, something that uh, easy to understand. Okay, so for the input register, you create a quantum register. Okay. And for the output, you create a register and name it out. Okay, so uh, from the point of view of uh, of uh, you know qubits, input and output registers, you know that one they are they're, they're both qubits, except one is the input and one is the output. Okay, and then here create a classical register. The number three here means that there are three classical bits. Okay, so three bits. Here we have. Three input register and we have one register. Okay. Let's see it here. So we have a uh, uh, in, okay, and out, and then you have a C. Okay. okay so to simulate it, okay, so we can uh, simulate this, uh, uh, simulate this in in our local. And then we get uh, the result, which is for a, a thousand uh, a thousand shots. Okay, the result is the same. Okay, which means that all qubits are in zero zero uh, state. That's the very simple. Now, what happens if we have if we introduce the not gate? Okay, so if we introduce the not gate, what will happen is that. Uh, the initial, the initial uh, qubit here, which is zero, will be flipped into one. So that if you measure this circuit, it will give you with the probability 100% zero, zero, 001. Okay. So what's the, uh, okay, so later I'll show the code for that. And this one is using the Hadamard gate. So, uh, you have here a Hadamard, which you apply to all, uh, all uh, input qubits, and then you measure. Okay, so when you measure, you will just get. So what happens is that this one will give you the superposition of states. Okay, so that when you measure it many times, you will you will see that the probability of each state to occur is is almost the same, radically the same. Okay, it's almost the same. Okay, so, uh, 
So this one is an example of a control not gate. So um, here, if you remember, the control not has a control qubit and a target qubit. So if the control qubit is one, then the target target qubit will be flipped. Okay. So so what happens here is that the uh, the input qubit, which is currently at zero, is flipped and becomes one. And because it becomes one, the control dot uh, gate will will flip this uh, input qubit to be one. And what happens now is that if you measure the system, this becomes one. This becomes this stays at zero, and this becomes one. And that's why you have one zero. Okay, uh, this one is a sample of a full circuit adder. So we have two qubits. We want to add the two qubits. And how do you represent that in in Kiskit? Okay. So how do you represent this uh, circuit in Kiskit? This is how it looks like. Okay. So what you do, what we do is, uh, okay, this is actually the one that you see here is implementation of the two-bit uh, circuit, uh, two-bit uh, full adder circuit. And then what, what we're doing here is just to make superposition, okay? So as you can see, this is nothing but, this is similar to our two dice, okay? So the only difference is that our die is only from zero up to three, okay? <laughs> so, so we have a die with three faces, and the values of each face is zero, one, two, three, okay? And as you can see that the, uh, the probability of getting a three is at uh, this point, okay? And this one is the first time Vasarandi algorithm, which I'm not going to elaborate, but but the important thing to note here is that the, the drawing that you see here can be can be uh, represented as mathematics. Okay. And since you have a mathematics already, you can use your pencil and paper to get the answer. Okay. So now you see that there's a definite answer here, okay? That's the uh, so you can translate your, your drawing of a circuit into mathematics. That's why the mathematics is important, okay? Because uh, uh, I mean, just like a programmer, you know, uh, if, if, a pro if, if you give someone a uh, IDP, it doesn't make them a programmer. No? What makes them a programmer is the, the knowledge of how to program. They can use, for example, a uh, notepad to program. Okay? So, so that, that's the reason why we need this, uh, the foundations uh, of, uh, of quantum computer. So I think uh, the next thing I'll do is uh, I'm going to uh, skip this and uh, And I'm going to see if I can. Okay, so, so my computer is, is uh, uh, having a problem, but hopefully we can still uh, see the demo. Okay, so. Uh, let me see if I can. Device this uh, one. Okay. Okay, so um, this is just a demo of the other part. Okay.
let me uh, let me unshare first because uh, it's uh, hacking my system. Sorry about that. Stop sharing first. Let me see if my computer can uh, normalize. Okay. Okay, let me see. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll start to share it once again. Uh, share. Share. Okay, let's stop to. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah. So this one is uh, is it um, <clears throat> using uh, it's known as the uh, uh, Jupyter notebook. Uh, it's very easy to install, but if you need help with this installation, I can give you a uh, uh, hey. So what you want to do is uh, try to run this. Okay, so I think already. Uh, so we, we went through the we went through the code now actually. So so in here, uh, let me let, let me run this first. So you can see uh, a uh, asterisk there, it means it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Just need to wait because my, my laptop is having uh, an issue. Okay, so uh, probably while waiting, uh, do we have some questions? Zoom. I'll zoom the screen. It's 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 small. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, but so the problem is it might have. Okay, so I will not just. Uh, okay, so what's happening here is that uh, I create a. Uh, so there is an import here. Okay, so the import is. Uh, there are some imports, and then you create your quantum register, and then your. Uh, so we create a quantum register with. With uh, two qubits. So this is the input register. And then we create a cluster register in order to uh, get the measurements. And then we create a quantum circuit. So the quantum circuit, we specify the input register and the uh, uh, classic classical uh, register. And then uh, we do a superposition. Okay, so that the other mark, so we already know what the other mark is, except that we don't know how to how to uh, how to use the how does the other mark look like in code? Okay, so this is how it looks like. So you have a quantum circuit, and then uh, you invoke the H function, which stands for other mark, and then you uh, the input. And then the, the argument of this function is the uh, the input qubit at, at position zero, and then we have another other mark here that uh, with uh, the argument is uh, uh, input qubit one. So that's what you see here in the drawing. 
okay, a little bit of barrier. Okay, so if we if we go through the barrier, then what happens that uh, uh, sometimes the uh, things don't align, so we have to barrier that. And then we measure, okay, and then we draw. Okay? This is a very simple uh, code. Okay? Then the next thing what you want to do is to run it via simulator, quantum simulator, and then we run it. Okay. Okay. So it's now running, but it's uh, it's, it's low. Uh, it's just a uh, Wait for it. And so this is the, the result of the um, simulation. So as you can see, uh, the hardened mark will allow you to do a superposition of, of your of the values of the uh, input qubits. Okay, so the input qubits, uh, which, which you can see here. So the next thing I'll show you. Is the uh, see if I can show you. Actually, having a problem getting to okay. at the closest one. Okay. At the closest one. Okay. To get to the next demo. Okay, so this uh, verse time versus uh, uh, demo, I'm not going to show that. <clears throat> and then the next is I'm going to show the uh, full other circuit. Okay, and here, uh, let's try to run this. So the full other circuit is the one which, so you, you have two qubits and you want to add them like, uh, as in addition. And and then uh, measure okay, the, the the sum. Let's uh, let's wait for it to uh, let's wait for it to okay. So uh, there's actually a lot of things going on here, but. Um, that would probably be a topic for another for another day. Yeah, I, I usually get this problem when uh, when streaming uh, or when doing uh, Zoom calls. Um, it needs a lot of my resources, so the. Uh, it's now, it's now executed, and this is the uh, the uh, uh, two qubit adder circuit. And then, if we if we uh, uh, simulate it, let's run it. Okay. So you should get something like a. Uh, Quantum dice or theta. Okay. Okay, you don't want to run it again. Uh, if you run it again, it will, it will give you a different result. Okay, okay so uh, that's it. Um, I think uh, we can have some questions. Are there any questions? Later? No, no questions. Later. Just one question. Uh, actually, you can just, okay, let me just uh, read this question. So processing of loads of data and doing complex computing tasks consumes energy and takes toll on the hardware. Is it possible for our current technology to utilize quantum computing for a complex tasks? If so, what is the minimum hardware requirement to conduct, for example, a search program that utilizes uh, machine learning? Okay, 
Uh, that's a very good question. So, so, so quantum computing um, can be simulated. So, like that, like like what you are seeing here can be simulated by a classical classical uh, uh, computer. But then, um, but there's a limit because what happens is that uh, every every uh, qubit qubit that you uh, that you simulate is actually a matrix, which is uh, which is a uh, a column matrix, which is uh, one and zero. Okay, so if you simulate two qubits, which this means that you need uh, uh, two squared uh, of uh, two squared of uh, uh, of this uh, memory. Okay, and the more qubits that that you have, that 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 you need to to simulate, it's uh, so for example, it's, there's a so, for example, if you have uh, uh, two to the, if your memory is uh, two to the third, if, if you have a one gig memory, one gig memory is two to the thirty. Okay, that makes sense. So two uh, raised to the third, one gig memory. Okay, so simulating thirty qubits already had. Will consume uh, one gigabyte of memory. Okay. Now, now if 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 you add another qubit there, okay, if you add another qubit, which means uh, instead of thirty qubits, you have thirty-one. What will happen? It's now time to break the So what will happen is that you have two raised to the uh, thirty-one. Okay. So that's uh. So that's uh, two gigabytes. Okay. So if you have uh, thir thirty-two qubits, so that's two raised to the thirty-two. Okay. That's uh, four qubits. So it's um, it, it actually to, to simulate a quantum computer in a in a desktop, you know, it's is 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 uh, doable, but it has limits. So which means that. Um, if you need to, so which means that if you need to do machine learning uh, using uh, a quantum machine learning, then you need to have a, a quantum computer in order to uh, be able to handle uh, large numbers of uh, qubit. Now, um, there are some, so for example, in um, Right now, um, for the IBM quantum computer, if I'm not mistaken, they, are, they have about 120 plus uh, qubits. So that's actually two raised to the 120. Okay, so number of uh, number of uh, two raised to the 120. That's a very big number, but it's still. Hundred and fifty, right? So that's that's still uh, very small. But uh, but but the thing is, um, there are already um, so right now the state of quantum computing right now is that uh, the classical computers, you know, can still handle. What, what, what the number of qubits that the quantum computer has right now, the, 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 the size of the problem it can solve, can be solved easily by, by, the, uh, by the classical computer. So right now. But the thing is, uh, that, that's the promise of quantum computing. Okay, so, so, I mean, we, there's a lot of challenges to building a quantum computer. Uh, for example, one of the biggest challenges is uh, in order to maintain uh, superposition of states, you know, you need to 
you need to isolate your system. You need to isolate your system from the environment because the environment will interact with your, your qubits and it will it will it will basically equal here collapse the wave function. So um, that's that, that's one challenge. And and the way that they are trying to uh, uh, so there's a there's error correction involved. And the, the thing about the error correction is that um, it needs also a lot of uh, a lot of qubits. Okay. So um, if I'm not mistaken, the for the Shores algorithm uh, 2048-bit encryption, you need, you need about 100, uh, a billion qubits in order to do error correction. So, so that's still far from, from the capabilities. But, <clears throat> but the thing is, um, you know, we, we believe in the human capacity to be, uh, you know, unless it's proven to be, to be impossible, okay, there's a, uh, a proof that it's impossible that, so unless it's, there's a proof it's impossible, then what we can do is just try to, to uh, you know, to, to engineer, you know? <clears throat> There's a lot of smart people in this world, um, you know, it's, it's possible that it might not be in our lifetime. It's possible that the that that what the, the technology that we are looking at right now might not be the technology that the future generation might be um, you know might be using. Okay, so there's a lot of unknowns, but there is hope. Okay, so that's why um, in, in one quantum, quantum uh, our our goal is really for the uh, it's really really for the young generation. To steer them into that direction. So I'm not sure, M Michaela, uh, did, did, did I did I answer a question? Okay, thank you. Okay, um, actually, someone someone interrupted me earlier, but I don't know what this question is. Did, did, did anyone? Yeah, it was a troll. Okay. Yeah, so. Um, he, was, uh, he was discipling the Oh, yeah. It's, it's okay. I mean, I'm just doing the. I'm just. I was just telling the mathematics. Okay, so if, if, if someone disagrees with the mathematics, then. They will have to have a mathematical argument for the disagreement. Um, anyone else has a question? How many do you have? No more? Ah, uh, hello, Bobby. Ah, <clears throat> uh, hello, Bobby. Hi, Burns. Oh yeah, so uh, yeah, so uh, and it's that because she's Jacqueline. So one of the one of the best students and <laughs> Saint Carlos. So uh, let's say uh, let's one say one will say, begin um, one will begin uh, uh, trying to tread a path towards a quantum to, to, to become a quantum programmer. To become a quantum programmer. Um. And there are really no um and there are really no course right uh, now, diba? So so ano yung necessary right preparation. Now, so so ano yung necessary preparation for for hey, for one to go to the path. For one to go to the path. Okay, so in quantum computing you did you don't need to be a physicist. Okay. Um so, you don't need to be a PhD, okay? I mean, I can, I can, I can teach the book based on Nielsen and Chuang, you know, the, the book of uh, the form of the, the de facto, the de 
factor textbook on quantum computing, but I don't have a PhD. Um, probably first you need to have uh, mathematical maturity. Okay. Okay. So when I was in physics, I was trained. I was trained to to think in a continuous like the world was a continuity. Okay, so which means that between zero and one, there is a lot of numbers. Okay, that's continuity. When I was in computer science, I was trained to uh, to think in this in, in discrete numbers. Okay, one, two, three. Those are two different things, okay? And the mathematics is different, okay? So, um, if you want to go into quantum computing, um, to have a, well, I would not want to discourage, okay? But, um, I mean, we can, we can teach quantum computing the basics, okay, in, in probably high school. But if you want to, for example, uh, learn um, about quantum computing from the textbook of these guys, uh, there's not much mathematics really involved there. Uh, probably, uh, so you need to have mathematical maturity, and then you need to have, for example, the uh, you need to have uh, linear algebra. Okay, so be able to understand uh, uh, operators. Okay? Uh, be able to understand what eigenvector, uh, eigenvalue is. Okay, um, then um, so be able to yeah. So that one there, uh, be able to you know uh, change bases. And so you have a for example if you if you use a this set of basis vectors, how do you convert it to another set of basis vectors? So that thing, uh, so we can algebra. And some uh, probability theory, okay? Like for example, you must uh, understand uh, what probability is, okay? And then be able to, um, because in, in quantum computing, you know, you, 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 you just don't draw diagrams, okay? So, and then design an algorithm, and then that's it, okay? So you have to, you have to, uh, you have to demonstrate, okay? So how many times your, your algorithm will need to be uh, executed in order for, for the answer to be, to be, uh, to be found, okay? And then you need to, and, and the probability also, you need to, you need to compute for uh, the, the probability of, of getting the answer, okay? So, for example, in, um, uh, in quantum computing, you need to come up with algorithms that will give you uh, a high probability of the answer being found. When I say high probability, if you, if you increase the number of, for example, uh, uh, qubits, then the, the probability of the answer to be found also approaches unity or one, okay? So, so I already mentioned you know, algebra, <coughs> uh, all this uh, probability theory. <coughs> There's also, bit of number theory, okay? But all of this, you know, are just, I mean, if you, if you just want to learn, you know, understand, then uh, I think mathematical maturity is, because when you are mathematically mature, you can actually pick up mathematics easily. Just like a programmer, a programmer that is uh, a senior programmer, you know, can, learn a language in a few days if you give him a problem and for example you ask him to program this language and he hasn't program that language to allow him the, his uh, maturity allow him to pick up that language uh, 
And the same way with mathematics. So, for example, in Charles Alberta, you need to have some number theory, okay, and then you need to have, uh, especially in the, if you're dealing with, uh, with uh, uh, quantum Fourier transforms, and then you need to, you know, you, you just need to know, like, for example, trigonometric identities. You just be comfortable. You don't need to memorize all of them. You just Google them. But be able to, you know, simplify okay, things and arrive at the, the answer. So, but that's just uh, the, uh, that's, that's just one part, okay? Because uh, ultimately, a quantum computer is a tool, okay? So, for example, my my favorite in in in, compu in computation is actually optimization. Okay, so so there are a lot of black box algorithms out there that you can already use in order to optimize a certain problem. What's really important is that you yourself know how to formulate a problem. Yes. In such a way that you will cast this problem into an input yes. that will be, you know, that will be used by the quantum computer. So, for example, D wave. Okay, I mean D wave. You can you can use D wave like a black box. Like you just what's really important is that you know how to formulate these problems. Okay, and then and the usual, you know, sensitivity is this. Is this uh, solution sensitive to a few uh, perturbations in your input? So something like that. So those are things that you don't need quantum computing, but are skills that you need in order to maximize your use of the technology. So uh, mathematical maturity plays a big role. And then the rest, you, know, you can just study. Okay, I uh, I have the impression actually that uh, yes, uh, I have the impression actually that uh, uh, at the end the uh, at the beginning is really the translation to an algorithm of uh, any problem that you want to solve with quantum computer. Problem that you want to solve with quantum. Essentially, yes. that's the start the starting point, and so, then uh, essentially that's the start. The starting point, and then um, there must be some way to interface to a real quantum computer, and uh, the interface is is really like uh, converting that to a programmable code. It's really like converting that to a programmable code, and then giving you a circuit yeah, that I mean, can run on a system. I mean, I, I, a circuit that I, can run on a system. Yeah, I, I get your point. Um, so. So since um, all of us here have different perspectives, um, I understand your perspective because uh, you came from a background you know, where you are really hands-on, you want to know what's really going on in a, in a quantum uh, computer, how, how does it really compute? Right? That's, that's your perspective. Uh, my perspective also is, uh, like for example, uh, just like a uh, user of a computer, right? Um, I just use it. I don't really mind what's underneath. Like, mm. I don't really mind how the integrated circuits do all their work. All, all of these uh, things are put together to have a computer. Uh, yeah, so that's my, my, my perspective. So, um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, strictly speaking, quantum computing is really uh, uh, like a, a branch of quantum information science. And it's really about algorithms. It's really about but if you want to, if your if um, focus is really, you know, really making it, that's an entirely uh, different skill. Okay, so I think for that one, uh, you might need a PhD. And um, in either or so. But in the future, when this one is already commercialized, okay, so you can just, you know, 
people in the factory don't need PhDs, right? So it's just mm -hmm. hard for people to do something very specific. As a PhD has already talked about it. So right now, we, since we are still in the infancy, yes, probably need a PhD. But for quantum computing, I think you only need to uh, because because uh, sure Peter Short Short's algorithm Rover's algorithm they have shown us how to do things how to think in a quantum like way which is different from how we think as a traditional programmer right? so now that they've shown us the way then we can also adapt to it. So, I mean, if you're into research, I have a PhD, but you just want to use the quantum computer and you have the, uh, you know, the requisite mathematical maturity to use it, then, you know, just spend a lot of time and then you can solve your problem. Anything else? Okay, I think that's it. Um, okay, so since there are not so many questions, so I wonder if you did understand okay, what I was saying or you understood, okay, and then you don't have questions. Um, but I thank you for for attending uh, this event. Um, so we are the One Quantum Philippines, and uh, there are a lot of things that we want to do in order to make uh, the Philippines a quantum ready nation. Okay, so in fact, we want to be able to penetrate not only the physicists, no? the mathematicians, but people in other industries, okay? Even teachers, right? Teachers, like for example, in, in, uh, in I think it was in Brazil, they, they, they used English teachers in order to, to give awareness of quantum computing to the students. Students want to learn English, okay? so that's that's the way they do it. Okay? Why not use the teachers as the medium in order to raise awareness? So you, you can help us, okay? even if you if you don't do want to, you, you can help us in raising awareness. Um, because uh, what we want to do is really to make quantum. Part of you know, everyday thing for our kids in the future, so that it will just be very useful for them. Okay. Okay, so that's it. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, guys, for attending, and uh, yeah, I hope I will, will be able to see you once again in our uh, next. Uh, Okay. So, um, before we go, I just want to mention that we have an upcoming activity uh, in June 6. Okay, so June 6, um, we have a speaker. Uh, he's, a, he's actually uh, spoken to a lot of uh, uh, conferences already. Uh, recently, he spoke at a conference sponsored by The Economist. In, in, in UK, and it was all about quantum computing, okay? And this guy is, has been searching for quantum computing talents for the past eight years, okay? And he will tell us about what the future looks like, not only the future of us, what he's uh, looking at right now in terms of, of uh, careers in quantum computing. Okay, so there are already people in quantum computing working in quantum computing. 
And if you want to be one of those guys or girls, uh, you know, you, you attend and then you ask questions. Okay, so that's one. Uh, next week we will we will um, own our, uh, our another run of of our uh, Shores algorithm series uh, series. It's actually a seven part part series, and um, we are going to record it so that if you cannot attend, uh, you can just take a look at the recording. And we are also going to give some exercises uh, to test your understanding. Okay. Um, yeah. So so far, that's that's what we have in mind, and you know, uh, I hope you support us you know, just by attending and making people aware. Okay, uh, sharing our group to your friends. Okay, if you're on Facebook or you know whatever social media. We only have actually a Facebook page, but then you can, you can share. It. So thank you very much. Uh, anything else? I, uh, yes. I, I want to mention uh, Bobby. I want to mention I something. I would like to call Brian. I want to mention Bobby. Yes. I want to mention something. Uh, uh, I, I just want uh, to yes. tell everyone that uh, uh, the government I has... Uh, that everyone that, uh, the government the OST will have a... Um, a collaboration with the Hungarian government, uh, a collaboration with the Hungarian government for the development of quantum computing in the Philippines. For the development of quantum computing in the Philippines. Uh, I, uh, it's a, uh, it's gonna be massive in the application. I saw the it's document a, a little bit. Massive in the application. I saw the document a little bit. Uh, they they even intend to use quantum on agriculture. They, so they even intend to use quantum on agriculture. So yeah, I think that that's that's a, that's a start. So which means uh, we have a bright future, you know, ahead of us. Um, thank you for that, Burns. Um, I think this will be the last, uh, Brian. So we have here actually in our group. We are very happy to have it. Um, this is an author of two books. Uh, he's an American. He has been supporting us. And, uh, he was the uh, person responsible for making us part of One Quantum Global. Uh, his name is Brian. Brian is a co-host. Um, Brian, can you tell us something about your book so that uh, you know, people here will be interested in reading the book? Uh, thank you. It's a career guide. It's called you. Choose it's Your a, Own a Quantum guide. Adventure. It's called and it's, uh, adventure. And well, depending it's, on your background, uh, that's part of the, well, on the design of it, that if you're new, it guides you in one section of the book. If you're uh, looking to further education, it guides you to a different area of the book. If you're already working in the industry, it guides you to another area of the book, but it's about quantum careers. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, Brian. So that, that's it. Uh, that's for the, uh, the new book of Brian. So if, if you really want to, if you're really serious about, you know, uh, reinventing yourself in quantum, then that's a good uh, guide for you. Brian uh, also has another book. If you're interested, it's called Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons. That's, uh, that's, that's quantum stuff. If you're interested. Uh, yeah, so that's it. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, Okay, so thank you guys for attending and thank you. Uh, yeah, so bye. I'll see you next time.